I think we really have it now. Okay, so back to the topic at hand. I have, there's a few things I want to say about this topic. One is I am not Native American. I'm not an indigenous person. I'm not an expert either, but I am somebody who got real interested in why I couldn't find more information out about the indigenous people that were here in Michigan, especially in Oakland County. Um, and so part of the question, part of the process of asking questions and finding the answers to those as a local historian turned into um, a book, but also uh, it makes for a great slide presentation, especially to people who are interested in this topic and really never learned that much about it themselves. Uh, it's not going to cover every possible thing by any means, uh, but I do want to give you a highlight of what I think uh, pertains to the Saginaw Trail, in Oakland County in specifically, but I have to tell you a little bit more about the bigger picture before we get to that. Um, and you're free to ask questions while we go along. And those of you who are in Zoom, uh, we have a, a moderator who um, you could chat your question to and she will uh, state your question when you have one and I'll restate it and then we'll answer it as we go. So just feel free to um, jump right in if you have something that you want to, to know more about. Okay, I mentioned a book. I wrote this book. Um, I'm the museum director at the Birmingham Museum, and we were doing an exhibit on the Woodward Avenue's history, which was the Saginaw Trail. And there's no easy way to tell that history in a short book like this one had to be, but it does cover a lot of the history. But the history of the Saginaw Trail, of course, of, Bourbon, of uh, Woodward starts with the indigenous people who created the trail. And that's how I got some of the answers to some of my questions. So yes, I am promoting it. It is available at the museum and uh, if, you were interested, um, all the proceeds benefit the Birmingham Museum. Just give us a call and um, we'll help you with that if you wanna buy one or, or just come and flip through it and see what it says. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there is a copy in the library here people could check out. And so I'm not gonna go into the detail about the sources consulted, but local historians and nerds like me uh, we'd like to show you a little bit more about what our primary sources were. So it's not what granny said, her uncle said, the you know neighbor down the road said, but it's something that we actually tried to track down and find in a primary source, a written document. There are a number of sources uh, behind the information I'm gonna be sharing with you tonight. And this is just a brief list of them. Um, first thing to clarify is that in Michigan, at the time of settlement, the tribes who were utilizing the land here were mostly belonging to the Algonquian or what the, the people called the Anishinaabe tribes. And the primary three tribes in Michigan were the Odawa, which um, are also the Ottawa, the Potawatomi, and the Chippewa or the Ojibwe. And they each, at the time of settlement, had areas of Michigan that were basically their territory. Um, so the Odawa were more northerly and northwest uh, lower Michigan, the Potawatomi more western uh, lower peninsula and southern Michigan, and the Chippewa or Ojibwe in the UP, but also in the northern lower peninsula and along the eastern coast and very heavily uh, in the Oakland County area. What's significant about the Saginaw Trail is that it's part of a larger trail system. And what you uh, see on the slide here are two representations of some of those trails. Um, the one on the left, I know you can't make out the detail of it, but that is somehow, if I could move this, you could see it better. Let me put this all the way at the top. Shoot. Yeah, that's a little better. Um, the state archeologist Wilbert Hinsdale in 1933 at the U of M uh, undertook a project to, to outline and map the known 
Native American trails at the time. And so all those red lines there represent some of the mapping in Oakland and Macomb and um, Livingston counties. And if you're interested, you can go online for free. You can look at these maps, you can zoom in, you can zero right in almost you know, to your neighborhood and find out if there were any mapped trails um, in your particular area, or if you have property up north and you think, you know, I wonder if there were any, you know, native trails through uh, where my cottage is or something. Um, it's fascinating. So uh, he did a great um, service to those of us who came later who wanted to understand how the native people use the land. Forward. Hmm. It's not advancing for some reason um, on the forward button. Um, if you click. It was. Okay. So why was the Saginaw Valley important? The Saginaw River watershed, where the Saginaw Trail led, was one of the richest um, watersheds available to the Native American indigenous people that were using the land. And this gives you an example. On the, in the color map there, the Saginaw River watershed is that kind of orangey ochre color. It's very large. It covers a great number of square miles in Michigan. And, um, it, water. It's the watershed. It means like that's where all of the streams and everything drains into. So everything drains toward the Saginaw River and then into to uh, um, Saginaw Bay. And that watershed area was heavily populated by the Saginaw Chippewa Native people. And it was full of resources. In fact, the fur trade. Um, was really active in the um, Saginaw uh, Valley, Valley much later than other parts of Michigan. Um, it was also more remote. It was also swampier and wetter and a little harder to navigate. Um, the important thing I want to leave you with though about the fur trade was how the fur trade, at least in the Great Lakes areas, contributed to the indigenous people's economic dependence on the trade system. So after, over time, um, being able to trade furs was an essential part of how they were able to get blankets for their family, some foodstuffs. And the more they trapped and traded furs, the less they um, used their traditional life ways. And so they became more and more dependent on trade and uh, the European um, goods that, that they were trading for. Guns, I didn't mention guns. Guns were very important because that's what they began to use more predominantly for hunting. Um, the title there that you can't quite see says the impact of War of 1812 on relations with indigenous people. So as the fur trade was winding down a little bit in Michigan, um, there were other things at work all, all throughout the world, but in the Great Lakes, the War of 1812 was still primarily about controlling the land and doing it so that there was access to the furs, which were still very valuable. Um, now, during the War of 1812, uh, whether you're real familiar with it or not, I think you know that it was British. Uh, in the, on the Canadian side of the Great Lakes primarily, and the Americans on the um, American side of the Great Lakes. And the fight to control the land was put the uh, indigenous people right in the middle. Um, most of the indigenous people that fought with the British were Saginaw Chippewa from, from the Great Lakes area, were Saginaw Chippewa. And the Saginaw Chippewa, which who were a very numerous tribe, always had um, a grudge because they knew that the American um, government wanted their land. 
They knew that the Americans wanted to take away what they had, and there was a lot to fight for. The British weren't interested in colonizing. They weren't putting up um, cities in the middle of you know, Michigan. They didn't care about that. They wanted the furs, they wanted to control the territory, um, but they weren't interested in, in the land itself. And so over time, the indigenous people sort of developed a balance with the British that they had also had previously with the French, which is basically, you know, we'll leave you alone if you leave us alone. And then when the war started, the Americans who were going to be intruding on the native population, um, that there was a reason to fight against them. And so many of them went to fight with the British. And I'll be talking a little bit about some individuals later. One of the things that the British really took advantage of um, was to strike terror into American troops and the small numbers of the American population who were in, in Michigan at the time uh, because of the uh, war tactics used by indigenous people. When indigenous people were at war with each other, it was brutal. And so if they were at war with Americans, it was brutal. And they did a lot of the, you've, you've heard about the scalping and all of that kind of thing. That was part of the, the way they culturally went to war. Well, the British helped use those very frightening images to promote fear. And it really kind of like terrorism with the uh, American soldiers. And in the case of Hull in Detroit, Hull uh, became convinced that, that there were huge numbers of Native American people on the British side that were gonna overrun them and massacre them all. And that had a lot to do with him surrendering Detroit, uh, even though it turned out that wasn't the case. So it's just something to keep in mind that that preceded um, the period I'm gonna be talking about where settlers were coming into Michigan. All of these stories, the things that circulated about the Native people. And uh, Americans committed atrocities also. Um, it was a two-way uh, thing in terms of the violence and the, and this depicts um, a massacre by Americans of uh, peaceful people, women, children, um, et cetera. So this is um, what you can't see under there. It says timetable of the, um, so what exactly does it say? Move this. Yeah, just the timeline of 1812 to 1819, the really important number of years leading up to some of the major political changes that affected the indigenous people and Michigan and its settlers. So in 1807 was the Treaty of Detroit. It transferred um, many Southern Michigan lands from indigenous holdings to the US government. Um, the indigenous people would continue to make the annual trek to Detroit for payments based on this treaty. So one of the ways that they came and went to Detroit, besides going by boat um, or canoe, would be up and down the Saginaw Trail. So it, it had a lot to do with the movements of people through Oakland County. Um, then there's the War of 1812 from 1812 to 1815. It ended in February of 1815, but the British were very slow to leave Detroit. They were there, they hung out there and didn't really leave like they were supposed to until 1816. All that um, contributed to a delay, even though the US technically got the territory of Michigan after the war, um, I'm sorry, it, they actually had the territory of Michigan before the war, but the war kept them from um, um, utilizing the the territory. So even though the war was over, they couldn't really come back to Detroit and make a serious go of it and start surveying the land until 1816. So the land that had been converted from um, indigenous holdings to the U.S. government uh, started getting surveyed so they could sell it right away. Land sales began in 1818 in Detroit area and then in Oakland area in, um, in July in Detroit and December in Oakland County. So you can see how those things sort of start happening in a certain sequence and that makes a difference. 
in um, what happens next. So at the bottom of the slide, I'm gonna sp spend some time on the Treaty of Saginaw because in 1819, there's still a lot of tension. There's a lot of uncertainty within um, the lands that have not yet been transferred to the US ownership. And there's some fear that the native people will rise up against the American government and, and that they're not safe. And that has something to do with the events that happen next. All right, we're stuck again. Once you touch the top bar, yeah. your mouse gets stuck on that. So you can go back to your presentation and click on that, and then you can move forward. Oh, I'm glad you told me that. <laughs> Thank you. So a little bit about that American settlement process. The first land sales in Oakland County, these were formerly Indian lands. Um, and by the way, the term Indian, Indigenous people, Native American, they're all a little different. Um, Indian terminology shows up on a lot of old maps and trails and things. And so um, sometimes I will use it in that context. I try to use the tribal name when, when we know it. Um, a lot of the tribal names themselves still use the term Indian too. So some people prefer and some people do not care whether they're referred to as Indian or indigenous, but uh, I'm using them kind of interchangeably. Um, and I'm not meaning to offend anybody, just trying to get the point across here. Um, so the first land sales take place in Pontiac in November of 1818. That's the very first land sold in Oakland County, actually outside of Detroit, that was previously indigenous land. Um, and then Birmingham was- Do you know who uh, bought the land? Yes, the Pontiac property was bought by a development company of 15 um, investors, and it was called the Pontiac Company. And the whole purpose of buying this large tract of land was to put up a town. So they bought 128 acres. Um, and then in Birmingham, just you know, a month later, individual settlers bought property there. Um, and in Waterford in January of 1819, and this is further along the Saginaw Trail beyond Pontiac, um, the, um, there was the third uh, settler along the trail. And so just a little bit about that process is that the pioneer settlers might purchase the land and then build a cabin, or they might build a cabin on an un, 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 purchased land to improve it and then take their chances that they could buy that land after. So sometimes people lived on the land without owning it. Were there any instances of the indigenous peoples trying to buy the land that was there originally? Um, there's a little bit of history about that later in the century and more in the Mount Pleasant area. Um, but not at this time, because at this time, the, um, the Saginaw Chippewa who had previously used this land, they were allowed to continue to use the land until it was sold. So for all general intents and purposes, they were able to continue to hunt and fish and use the trail and so forth, um, even though the land no longer technically belonged to them and their tribe. So there really wasn't an incentive for them to purchase. Um, so surveying was being done, and this is a likeness of surveyor Hervey Park. He wrote a lot about what it was like to survey early Michigan. And that's where we get some amazing stories of weather, by the way. He, his accounts are very extensive and they're published and they're online and they're free to read. Uh, in the um, Michigan Historical Collections. So if you're interested in what it was like to be a surveyor in the wilderness, you might enjoy reading some of his accounts. Um, most of the wilderness settlers were veterans. They were given incentives to buy this land from the US government. If they were veterans, they could buy it for $1.25 an acre. So even at that time, 
even though money, you know, was still precious then, that was still a very good deal. And the point was, I think the U.S. was trying to populate this area as quickly as possible. And I, I think, you know, that's borne out by um, some of the policies that came later that, you know, the first you get the land away from the indigenous people, then you survey it, then you sell it, and then you get settlers on it. This isn't the only place in the world that's ever happened. The Saginaw Trail, a little bit more about the trail itself. Um, the map of Michigan on the left there shows you some of the major trails, and you may have heard of some of them. There's the Grand River Trail. In fact, Grand River Road still is marked Grand River Road all along different places between here and Lansing and on all the way to Grand Rapids, which is where the Grand River um, goes through. Another one is the Shiawassee Trail. And it was sort of, there's a little loop of it. It's um, the Saginaw Trail goes from Detroit up toward Saginaw, almost kind of like on a Northwest angle. And the Shiawassee has a loop that kind of parallels it a little bit more to the south and west. Um, and further north is the Mackinac Trail, et cetera. Here's a close up of the Hinsdale map I was showing you, a, a, a larger version of before. You can see that he overlaid it with a regular 1908 map that he had handy. Um, and all of the red lines um, and the short stubs are different side trails. These trails led between not so much permanent villages, um, but between campsites or between natural features that were important or between springs or between uh, deposits of certain kinds of minerals and ores that were utilized by the indigenous people. The Saginaw Trail between Detroit and Saginaw and beyond um, crossed a lot of swamps and a lot of streams. And even uh, the native people um, had to use certain kinds of navigation techniques to get through some of these swampy areas. Um, when early settlers came, a lot of times they would cut logs and throw them across the swampy areas and sort of turn it into what was called a corduroy road. And part of Woodward Avenue, Saginaw Trail, um, was like this out of Detroit for many years. Um, this is a map that represents one of the early surveyor maps. Um, there are two, uh, well, actually three dotted lines in this map that represent parts of the Saginaw Trail. Um, around the middle area where all the swampy water is, it splits into two halves and then it comes back together. That is where Royal Oak is today. And we all have problems with water in our basements, but people in Royal Oak are in a floodplain. And when the rains hit, the water is trying to get to the Red Run flood floodplain to drain away. And um, so I think a lot of times people in, in the area where some of the original um, uh, swampy areas were have the worst of it. So I'm just pointing that out because uh, navigating around the swampy areas was done all the time, but, um, but it wasn't easy. And uh, in this map too, if you look, you can see that there's a dotted line that splits off and heads Northeast. And that is the, the equivalent of Rochester Road going to Rochester. The other two um, are a combination of Crooks Road, which you, know, you can still kind of see the angle in Crooks Road and Woodward Avenue. Um, indigenous people developed some ways in the Great Lakes area and some other parts of the US of navigating through swamps by using what are called today trail marker trees. Trail marker trees were shaped from saplings chosen specifically um, by people who use the trail system to indicate 
where there would be a turn in the trail. If you're in a swamp, you don't know that you're supposed to turn that way, but a, a trail marker tree would guide you to the proper uh, outcome of the swamp and onto the trail. So here are three um, established, pretty well verified trail marker trees that um, were in the Great Lakes area. The one in the middle uh, was in Milan, Michigan, or Milan, I should say. And the one on the right was in Royal Oak. And right in these pictures, you don't see them in their swampy habitat surrounded by forest, but that is how they would have originally uh, looked. And that would tell you sometimes where to turn in the, um, on the trail or sometimes where you'd find fresh water, there would be a spring or other important feature. Um, when it comes to the Saginaw Trail, the, the, top, the um, line at the top says information accurate location wrong. Okay, this is a, a, a sign that is in Royal Oak along a section of Crooks Road, and it was um, placed there a number of years ago based on what they thought was accurate, calling um, the depression that ran along that area the original Saginaw Trail. But it isn't the original Saginaw Trail. It is a, a government road that was built on the Saginaw Trail and it kind of went off the trail and, and had a straight line. And if you go to this site today, you can see a depression and that would not have been the footpath. And I would just wanna clear that up. Um, this is, I wish it were accurate because I think the Saginaw Trail is fascinating, but this is really telling you where the old government road was. Um, to explain what happened to the indigenous people all over the US, but especially in Michigan, I think it helps to know the role that was played by Lewis Cass. When he was young, and in this picture, although he's you know losing his hair, he's quite young here. He was, uh, after the War of 1812, uh, well, actually during the war, but especially afterward, he was appointed territorial governor of Michigan. And he went on to try to build Michigan into a powerhouse state um, full of you know, natural resources for the betterment of the United States government. Um, he was also superintendent of Indian Affairs during that whole time. So he had an important role to play with the indigenous peoples in Michigan before well, when they still had some of their lands here. Um, he did speak uh, several dialects. He um, published a volume on the customs of Great Lakes Indigenous people in 1823. So he was, he was very uh, much a student of the cultures. Um, but unfortunately, his real focus was not on taking care of the Native Americans here. It was really on getting Michigan settled and turned into a state. And after a while, the native people just became an obstacle to that. So in 1831 to 1836, he became the US Secretary of War. And during that period, he implemented the infamous, um, Andrew Jackson's infamous Indian Removal Act of 1830. And that did occur in Michigan. You will have heard stories, I think, of the Cherokee Trail of Tears and some of the other really horrendous marches uh, that native people were put on to move them off their lands and move them west of the Mississippi. There were some roundups of Potawatomi here in Michigan. Um, some Potawatomi went willingly. It's kind of the writing being on the wall. Um, others were rounded up in, in carts and literally, you know, carted off to Oklahoma. And so there are a number of Potawatomi tribal people living in Oklahoma right now, as well as some in Michigan. Here is a map that kind of shows you three major treaty areas. The greenish uh, area at the bottom where Detroit and where we are was the Treaty of 1807. The pink area in the middle was the Treaty of Saginaw in 1819. 
Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And then the yellow is um, the second treaty of Detroit in 1855. And you can tell by the, by the years that what's happening is that there's a progressive treaty establishment taking more of the native land for the government. And where are those people going? What's happening to those people? That's part of the question that I always had that I was trying to answer. And hopefully I can explain some of that to you too. Um, so the heading says Treaty of Saginaw, 1819. The Treaty of Saginaw was negotiated by Lewis Cass. It was negotiated at Saginaw with tribes from different uh, tribal leaders from the Anishinaabe uh, peoples, but primarily Saginaw Chippewa, because why? Because he wanted that pink area and that was mostly controlled by the Saginaw Chippewa. There were 112 chiefs recorded and about 4,000 of their people camped there for the treaty talks. Treaty talks went on 11 days um, in the fall of 1819. And when the treaty was signed, it transferred 6 million acres of the indigenous homeland to the US. At this point in time, what are they, do they have a shared language? Um, the three primary tribes in, uh, in Michigan spoke a similar language and had very similar cultures. And they were called the people of the three fires they basically saw themselves as sort of cousins, I guess I would say. Um, they shared a lot of heritage and they often intermarried, but they had separate territorial areas. Did that answer your question? Um, one of the individuals at the treaty talks was named Ogima Kikito, which translates into chief speaker. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. I'd give it a try anyway. He was the leader of the Tidboasi band of Saginaw Chippewa, which Tidboasi, there's a river, if you didn't already know about the Tidboasi River. Um, he and his band sort of, um, their territory, let's say, was along the Tidboasi River. Um, bands would have usually, um, uh, there would be a number of family groups uh, who would um, kind of gravitate toward and, and would have a territory around a particular feature, like a river. So you will see sometimes like he was uh, the Tidboasi band because that was their um, land area. <clears throat> In fall of 1819, um, the Saginaw Chippewa were in dire straits. They were economically dependent. The British who had promised to pay them during the war, you know, the war cost everybody a lot of money. The British ran out of money and they didn't have the money that they had promised. Um, a lot of the treaty negotiations were for payments of cash and those payments of cash never came through like they should have. Um, and furthermore, the tribes were no match for Cass's need and aggressive um, intent on getting the land. He was very determined. It took 11 days of talks for him to get where he wanted to go. And he was not gonna leave without a treaty. What did the indigenous peoples get for these various treaties? What did the indigenous people get for these various treaties? Well, normally they would agree to um, sometimes they would get a reservation area um, that would be theirs forever, you know. Um, a lot of times they would get annual payments for X number of years, uh, like 20 years of annual payments. They often got payments uh, at the time of the treaty also. Those would be some of the more common things that would be negotiated at these times. Um, economically, getting money to buy the things you need to survive the winter um, ended up forcing the hand of a lot of the indigenous people because um, they were starving in many cases. Um, so this was the only thing they had of value to trade away and they did. <clears throat> 
Now, one of the points I have on this slide is that they misunderstood some aspects of the treaty. I'll give you an example. I mentioned that uh, they were entitled to continue to use the land until it was sold. That is not very specific. What does that exactly mean? Some native people understood that to mean that if you have pigs uh, on land uh, that are roaming through the forest, I'm entitled to those pigs. So there was a lot of um, conflict, I think, because those terms were not spelled out and they weren't spelled out probably for very good reasons, like you know, to make sure that the treaties were signed and finished up. So it's a very, um, it's a setup for failure and the tribes often knew it. And here's a really sad quote from Ogima Kikito at the Saginaw Treaty Talks that I, I'd like to share with people because he really, they could, he could see the writing on the wall and I think a lot of the chiefs did. He was recorded by um, Cass's, Cass had um, secretaries and so forth recording all the details of all the interaction. So this is the quote, your people trespass upon our hunting grounds. You flock to our shores, our waters grow warm, our land melts like a cake of ice, our possessions grow smaller and smaller. The warm wave of the white man rolls in upon us and melts us away. Our women reproach us. Our children want homes. Shall we sell from under them the spot where they spread their blankets? So I think you get a sense of how uh, pointless it seemed to resist uh, you know, this movement and to take the deal and, and melt away was what a lot of the native people did. Um, on the other side of this equation, it's welcome to Michigan. Come on in, buy land, put up your cabin and find paradise, you know, work hard and you'll succeed. And that's what a lot of settlers and pioneers coming to Michigan were expecting to do. They didn't really expect to have encounters with indigenous peoples. What's the year on that? I'm sorry? What's the year on that? Uh, it says 1858. So that's a cabin um, that was probably built during the pioneer period that people were living in in 1858. So um, the title says First Settlers on Saginaw Trail. Here's Oakland County as we would recognize it now. The red line is the Saginaw Trail, which corresponds roughly to Woodward Avenue. And um, one, two, and three there, uh, the first is Oliver and Alpheus Williams in Waterford. They actually were the first ones to go up the trail, find a place they liked and kind of hang out there. And they bought it the next spring and built their cabin. Um, number two is the site of Pontiac. The Pontiac company was, I was asked about that a little bit ago. On November 5th of 1818, 15 uh, investors from Detroit pooled their resources, a lot of them were veterans, so they could get the veterans deal on the land. And they bought 128 acres and began immediately to plat out a town. They wanted to turn it over, sell it. I mean, they're developers. We all know about developers. There were developers then, and um, that's what they did. And so there was a lot of activity on the Saginaw Trail in Pontiac almost immediately. And then the other place where there was some action was where the number three is, and that was in downtown Birmingham, what is now downtown Birmingham. And that was Willits, Hamilton, and Hunter. If you're from Birmingham, you know we have streets by those names, and we even have our burger place by one of those names. Um, but those were the three first land purchases in what is now downtown Birmingham. Um, some more examples of settler cabins, just to get an idea of what the lifestyle was like. Again, in, in that period, they would have been surrounded by heavy forest that was still being cleared. So Pontiac, Pontiac's town site. Pontiac is the first interior town in Michigan. 
think about that. The only settlements previous to this were along the shoreline, such as Mackinac, Detroit, uh, or at forts like Fort um, Dearborn over in Chicago around the Great Lakes. There were no interior towns until the Pontiac Company uh, bought this land and began to develop it. And this is a, a map of the area of Pontiac. And you, can, you can't you can see the Clinton River now when you go through downtown Pontiac because it's underground. But this is how it snaked through the area. And the place that they chose to develop was right smack dab on the Saginaw Trail, right where across the river. And it also happened to be a traditional long time used Saginaw Chippewa summer camp. Um, the title says other settlements. I'm just, I'll talk about Pontiac in a minute, but uh, other settlements were in Birmingham. And there were inns that were built along the Saginaw Trail to accommodate all the people coming up the trail to stake out their claim. And that includes the Hunter House in Birmingham, which is uh, shown on the lower right. When the Hunter House was built in 1822, it was built with an extra bedroom specifically to accommodate people traveling the trail that would stay the night and pay a fee for that service. When settlers came to Michigan and they were in Detroit and they were gonna buy their property, one of the things they would hear about is that what the, the scary things that would happen to them if they went out too far. If you go out too far beyond Pontiac, it's, um, uh, you know, you could be attacked, you could be massacred. In fact, these stories about indigenous people massacring settlers it never happened in Michigan. There's no recorded event ever of the murders that were recorded by indigenous people, they were recorded, but they were committed against other indigenous people. So the story about the Saginaw Trail, about settlement and about the indigenous people includes an important character who shows up in a lot of early accounts. He's very well um, documented. His name was Kishkako, which means the raven or the crow. And he um, led a band of Saginaw Chippewa from up in the Saginaw area. And during the treaty talks that I was talking about a little bit ago, he was very opposed to any treaty with the Americans. In fact, Kishkako did not directly fight for the British, but he had acted in um, against attacked Americans prior to the War of 1812. Um, he used to go to Ohio and, um, and attack and kill some of the um, Ohio settlers there outside of Michigan. And he was fiercely opposed to any treaty. Um, he was a problem during the, uh, during the negotiations. So someone made sure he found a lot of whiskey and he became very drunk for all 11 days and he was not present during any negotiations. So the next time he shows up is at the signing when he, he did sign the treaty, but he was opposed to it. So you can imagine as he comes and goes up along the Saginaw Trail and encounters settlers, how he might feel about them being there. In fact, he did terrorize a number of settlers and there are accounts of how he frightened them, threatened them, um, beat their wives with switches, um, stole livestock, all, all kinds of things like that. So he was, they were very afraid of him along the trail. And then um, he encountered Major Oliver Williams. Williams was that number one on the map, the first person who built a cabin and then bought the land later beyond Pontiac. So he's further out in Pontiac, further along the trail than anybody else. And um, because he was an early settler, he, he began to plant crops right away. 
So after the treaty, coming south on the trail, like probably within days of the treaty being signed, Kishkako and some of his fellow warriors in, uh, came across um, the Williams cabin. Uh, it was autumn. They were hungry. They began to uh, eat some of the pumpkins and things that were growing there. And Williams did a very amazing thing. He went out to greet them and offered to let them have whatever they wanted to. And he even utilized phrases that meant something to um, the indigenous language. You know, the great spirit has provided this, take all that, oops, take all that you want. Um, that kind of attitude changed everything. Kishkako and some of the elders actually came into the Williams cabin and brought in some tobacco with them. He shared some ritual tobacco with them. He understood why that was important. And because they were being treated with respect in ways that um, uh, recognized what was valuable to them in their culture, he ended up being made a member of the tribe. And after that point, he and all of his family members were never accosted or bothered ever by any Saginaw Chippewa again. And he was even asked later in life if he was ever afraid of the Indians that always came past his door. And he, he remarked that he felt safer around Indians than he did around some white men. So, um, this just tells that story a little bit. His sons, uh, he had four sons, and Alfred and uh, Benjamin O. Williams went on after him and continued that good relationships with the uh, um, indigenous people, the Saginaw Chippewa, actually in the Shiawassee Valley, and they continued to make money on the fur trade for a little while, and they, they um, founded the town of Owasso, in fact. So I wanted to just zero in then on some of these Northern Trail encounters, the Northern Trail of the Saginaw Trail, which would have been through Northern uh, Oakland County into Genesee County, uh, Grand Blanc area on, around Flint, between Flint and on up to Saginaw. Um, local indigenous people actually put up with a heck of a lot. For one thing, the white settlers, there was a disruption of their seasonal planting. So yes, the treaty promised that they could continue to use the land, but when they would go to where they seasonally grew their crops, which they kept maintained every year, um, they used to do a burning process where they would burn and the nitrogen would enrich the soil and then they would plant their, their um, crops and they, they would do this in different locations and then they would come back to harvest the crops later. Well, white settlers liked those openings because they were, they were already cleared. And so they often put their cabins right smack dab in these planting areas. So the indigenous tribes would come, the small groups would come to do their planting and there would be no place for them to plant this year. So that had a dramatic impact on their ability to, to raise the crops that they needed to survive. Um, the other thing that uh, was recorded a, a number of times is that the white settlers were completely ignorant of the language and the customs and for the most part didn't really attempt to learn any um, uh, anything more about it. Some, some definitely did, but many did not. Um, and there's a story about a Manitou stone or a sacred stone called the Baboqua up on the Saginaw Trail near um, what is now Grand Blanc that a local settler had built a cabin and dragged the stone away and used it in his fireplace. And so when the native people who discovered it, they came to his cabin to ask for it back. And he didn't want to give it back because he didn't want to take it out of his fireplace. And did they attack him? Did they murder him? Did No, 
but they insisted and they insisted and they insisted and they wouldn't leave him alone until he finally relented and he gave it to them. Um, there's a picture in the middle of this slide, it's probably hard to see, but it's a triangular shaped stone. This would be a common form of what a Manitou or spirit stone would have been. And usually it was associated with a sacred spot. So as people, um, indigenous people would come and go, they would usually stop and have ritual smoke or offer tobacco, you know, do some kind of uh, ritual ceremony before they moved on. So you can imagine what that was like when, um, when that was um, desecrated. Um, and there are a number of stories of indigenous people coming to the aid of settlers. For one thing, Massasauga rattlesnakes. Are you familiar with Massasauga snakes? They are a rattler that um, lives in swampy areas in Michigan. They're not as numerous now, but they were very numerous at the time. And um, you could get really sick and often die from the bites. They, um, the indigenous people would often provide, oh, thank you, um, uh, herbs and care because they knew how to treat snake bites. And they also showed the settlers how to wrap um, straw and things around their ankles that were too thick for the snake teeth to get through so they could easily walk through the marsh grass. They also um, often shared survival techniques for winter, how to, how to put uh, food up, how to make sure it lasted. Um, they often provided food, especially to surveyors. There are a lot of stories of surveyors who are out in the, in the winter every single day, even in snowstorms, who would get lost and they would be saved and rescued by um, indigenous people nearby. Uh, plus, they provided a lot of guides for um, tra travelers on the trail. So um, the picture that emerges is not one of scary Native people who are going to massacre you at night. It's really one of people who are just trying to survive and get by. Settlement just got more expansive. Here's a, a sketch that I like to show because it shows you know, the first steps in clearing for your cabin are to cut down these enormous trees and open up the sunlight so it could come in and you could plant a little bit around the tree stumps. And then the big work is pulling out the tree stumps and then, you know, eventually opening the whole land up for crops. Um, with more settlement and more movement of people on the trail and people coming and going in Detroit came disease. Um, and the, I'm, I'm sure you're not, that's not news to you that you've heard that um, indigenous people did not have the immune resistance to a lot of strains of um, viruses that were brought from the continent. Um, cholera and typhoid were very devastating. In 1834, there was a cholera epi epidemic in um, Michigan, which affected uh, European settlers too, but it really wiped out vast numbers of indigenous people. Smallpox was even worse. So just three years later, the smallpox epidemic um, that reduced the Saginaw Chippewa tribe by 70% of its population. And the, the stories are just horrendous. Um, people would come into a, a camp and they would have been in another camp and smallpox would show up and the village recognized that the, the disease was there. So everybody would run into the woods and they would go to their relatives and all their other camps. And that's how they would spread it. And it, it was so bad that there were whole camps full of people that, you know, were car corpses. There was no one to take care of them, the bodies. Another devastating uh, disease is, was alcoholism. Uh, again, for a lot of genetic reasons, uh, the indigenous people did not have some of the ability to withstand the effects of alcohol and its toxicity. And they also did not have um, social limits on consumption. There wasn't really any controls. And in fact, because of the change in, in state when you're drinking alcohol, it actually felt like an important spiritual experience. 
So um, it was a, a great opportunity for people who wanted to sell whiskey to the native people to make a lot of money and they would water it down and they would um, add chili pepper to it to give it a little more kick. And they would, you know, basically create uh, a lot of alcoholics out of people who didn't have very many natural defenses to that. Um, give, bringing around to another man I wanted to tell you about, this is Chief Okamas. Uh, Okamas is a version of the term Ogamans, which is just generally means leader or chief. Um, chief Okamas was a Saginaw Chippewa. He was born in the Saginaw Chippewa tribe and he was a young man during the War of 1812. And like many of the Saginaw Chippewa, he was a fierce warrior who fought to keep his land, fought to kill Americans. Um, he was nearly hacked to death. This is a, an important thing to know about him because he was almost dead. Um, he was uh, hacked with a, a broadsword or the, the hand weapon that a lot of the um, uh, soldiers would have once they fired their muskets. And um, he was he was taken care of and dragged off the field. Um, he recovered, but he was always, he had sort of a palsy ever after his, he had open wounds that never completely healed, but he went on to live a fairly long life. After the, uh, um, before the war was over, he actually went to Detroit and surrendered to Lewis Cass, who agreed to let him, to parole him, to let him leave as long as he took a vow and promised never to take arms up again against Americans, which Okamis did. And this is all recorded in the history of Detroit. Another uh, image of him, um, he moved up and down the Saginaw Trail a lot. Like I said, there were annual payments. So a lot of the people would come and, you know, the interesting thing about annual payments was you would only get paid for your family if all family members were there. So whole family members would have to get on the trail every year and go down to Detroit um, to show up for their payments so that they got it for the entire family. Um, back to Okemos though. He, after those the cholera epidemic and after the smallpox epidemic and all of the other poverty that um, was experienced by he and his um, fellow tribal members. He, he was increasingly impoverished. Um, he finally died in 1858. And he actually died in a white man's cabin because most of his family members had died. So we're plugged in. Um, I was saying that Okamas actually died in a white man's cabin. Um, he is buried somewhere in the area of, uh, in Iona, Onia County, the exact location, we don't know, but there is a marker there that has been placed there by um, his descendants. Um, so just to give you an idea, this, this is an example of the traditional life ways as presented by the Saginaw Chippewa Zeebwing Center. Um, the Zeebwing Center is near Mount Pleasant, and this, um, this is a display that shows wild racing, which was a very important tradition, both a spiritual and a food-based harvesting tradition of wild rice that grew in a lot of the swamps, especially along the Saginaw Bay. And next to it is a smaller image of a traditional wigwam-type um, dwelling. So this is, keep this in mind, this is the traditional life ways. And after the treaties, this is what the indigenous people, the Saginaw Chippewa were expected to conform to. So these are children taken away from their families and taken to um, these training centers and schools. And the idea was to help them become good Americans learn American ways so that they would be successful in American society. That was the basic idea. 
Um, but it, 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 especially in retrospect, we know that this was exactly the wrong thing to do. And most of these people were, um, if not traumatized by just the separation from their family and their culture and their language, they were physically beaten if they spoke their language or tried to um, uh, follow some of their traditional ways or uh, didn't conform. And many were abused. And you know there are even stories emerging today about um, mass graves of children who were, you know, didn't survive or were abused to the point of death. So um, how they, as a tribe, were able to retain their, their life ways so that they could tell us about it now is one of the amazing stories about the Saginaw Chippewa. Some of the other tribes in Michigan, like the Odawa, they were further north and their treaty arrangements because they had the advantage of um, when they did their treaty arrangements, they had a lot of educated um, tribal members who advocated for the right kind of treaty and they were able to stay in Michigan and they were able to be counted as citizens. And that's important because the US did not consider indigenous people to be citizens of the US. So they had no rights as citizens until the 1920s. Not completely done. I wanted to tell you somewhat of a success story about David Shapanagan. He found another way to deal with everything being thrown at his people. Also a Saginaw Chippewa. He um, was born in Saginaw. Um, he was a little, you know, born a little later than like Okemos. Um, he would not go to the reservation and he instead began to be sought out by hunters and uh, like the great big game hunters and stuff that would come to Michigan in the latter part after the Civil War to go hunting up north. So he actually played a part in kind of a conservation movement of a kind. In the Grayling area, he settled in and he was sought out, um, provided guides, made a fair amount of money at that, and his name began to be valuable. Um, he befriended a lot of these hunters and ended up traveling back to New York to visit them. It's real interesting how he maneuvered through this really difficult transition time. Um, his name, Shapanagan, was actually, um, he uh, was uh, bright enough to realize there was value in it and he leased his name to a lumber company who wanted to use it. So he got some income from that. Um, and I believe someone told me it's still there. There's a motel in Grayling that's still called Shapanagan or something like Shapanagans, um, named for him. And here's a picture of him. And I, I give this picture um, in part because it shows those two cultures side by side. And some of the demands that um, would have been faced by someone who grew up in a tradition so different from the one that their child grew up in. So that's his daughter with him. They're living in a wood frame house and um, he's dressed in full um, traditional dress in part because the white hunters who had come uh, really liked it. And he would be tipped heavily if he would do that. And they called him chief, even though he wasn't a chief and he didn't call himself that. Um, so that's just an interesting way that he managed to succeed in a, in a sense and maintain his independence. Now I have four slides following this one that were provided to me by the Southfield Historical Society. So we're from Birmingham, they're Southfield, we're partners, we're neighbors, we help each other out. But they also have some interesting exhibits that were recently installed um, and they were curated with the help of the Zeebling Center. So I'm showing you these slides in case you wanna go over and take a look at them. Um, so the, the exhibit is at the Town Hall Museum on the Northeast Shore Berg Road and Civic Center Drive. And it's based on the Potawatomi 
people who um, had for a time had actually a reservation, two reservations in Southfield. Um, so there's more about this at the exhibit, but I have a, a, a little bit I can show you about it. Here is a, one of those early surveyor maps and those outlined rectangles there. Those are two areas that were set aside to be reservations for Potawatomi in, um, in the Southfield area. <clears throat> And um, it says across the top, the Potawatomi of Southfield. Um, and what the settlers learned from the indigenous people, Darla Van Hoy from the Southfield Historical Society put this material together. So um, she's talking about some of those life ways that were taught to settlers. The three sisters planting method um, was corn, beans, and squash. So the native people um, found that these three plants not only could be planted together, but they would actually thrive because each one offered something that the other one need. So corn provided the structure so that beans could climb on it. And the squash uh, grew around the base and kept a lot of the weeds away. Um, another tradition is the tradition of lacrosse, which you know is a fun sport these days. Um, and the sugar bush that refers to maple syruping which we also still love dearly in Michigan these days. Um, the third slide, um, she's talking a little bit here about or showing the exhibit that talks about the language, the language, uh, some of the translations, um, the written language, um, there, there was some attempt to write down some of the Chippewa language and that has survived on pieces of birch bark, but most of the traditions were not written or couldn't be written and they're oral only. That is the chief way that information has been passed down within the tribes is through oral stories and oral traditions. Um, so um, miigwech or miigwech means uh, thanks. It's a greeting. And um, it's a way of acknowledging another person. A few more things that are typical of the Potawatomi, but also the Saginaw Chippewa made similar things, and so did the Odawa. Uh, black ash and birch bark basket, basket making. So black ash is interesting. The way that those baskets are made is black ash is a, is a type of wood that if, the, if a log is cut or a tree is cut, and if it's pounded with a heavy you know, rock or something, the way the, um, the wood splits into long strips makes it very easy to weave into baskets. So black ash basket, if you ever see the real thing, it's been made that way. That's, um, that's why they're always black ash. Uh, birch bark baskets, um, are surprisingly strong. Um, they're surprisingly uh, that you can put, you can boil water in them. And that's how maple syrup was usually boiled was in birch bark until they, they got iron kettles. Um, carrying a baby, you know, some of the traditions for keeping the baby always with the mother. And then sweat lodges, which are a very important part of the spiritual experience of many Native American peoples. So again, the Potawatomi of Southfield is a permanent exhibit at the Town Hall Museum on the northeast corner of Berg Road and Civic Center Drive. That is the conclusion of my talk, but I am happy to try to answer any questions or take any comments. And I'm gonna leave it up there. <laughs> again, shameless, shameless self-promotion. The Saginaw Trail is the book. It does. It's about more than Indigenous people, but Indigenous people are talked about in it. Um, it's it's really about people along the whole Saginaw Trail, and uh, I encourage you to check it out of the library, or come by the museum, and we'll let you flip flip through an example. There are a lot of great photos. Oh, you have a copy. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Um, so. Anyway, are there any questions from either any members of our Zoom participants or anybody in the audience here or any comments? Well, it was a wonderful presentation. 
Thank you. Do we have anything from the Zoom? Oops. Yes. The National Battlefield of 1812 War in Monroe is going to have a native display too. The National Battlefield in Monroe is going to have a native lodge display. lodge display pretty soon. That's good. That's good to hear. There are there are some interesting museums around Michigan that have native materials, but um, uh, the, I, I recommend that to learn about the native people, you, you go to where the tribal museums are first, because a lot of the smaller museums may not have as much information or might not be as accurate. Raisin River, actually, the battlefield site has been turned into a national park, the second one after Isle Royal, and they have been purchasing all this land around it. They're going to take down the house and things, and it's really going to be something fantastic. And the mascot is Major Muskrat. You don't yeah. have to see a seven-foot muskrat with ranger outfit. <laughs> Right, so a member of the audience is saying that the National Battlefield is a recently uh, designated uh, national park and that it's being uh, en enlarged by acquiring more land and that it's really great and they have a muskrat mascot. How wide was the trail? Oh, how wide was the trail? Great question. For the most part, when it was being used as a footpath only, it was just one person wide. In fact, it was so narrow, partly because of the indigenous um, walking, uh, not technique, but tendency to walk with one foot directly in front of another, uh, which is a quieter way to walk. But also, um, so, so it was mostly that narrow most of the time. But as soon as it started getting improved and more people, were, white people were using it, they needed to make it into a roadway so they could get carts across it. And that's when it got to be widened. Are there many folks still around the area who identify themselves as indigenous? And if so, what tribes? Um, well, that's a great question. Of course, people who are indigenous live everywhere, including you know in Birmingham and Detroit. Uh, but whether they are active members of the tribe um, is, uh, you know, kind of a personal decision. But if you wanted to understand the tribe in, a, in its uh, official location, you would need to go to uh, one of the tribal centers. So for the Saginaw Chippewa, that's Mount Pleasant primarily. There's, there's another um, smaller place as well. The Odawa have, well, there are a couple different tribes. There's the Little Traverse Bay Band is up near um, Traverse City, and then there are other Odawa areas up there where there are reservations, there are tribal centers and archives. Uh, their archives tend not to have a lot of documents in them, but they do have some materials. Yes. I somehow had this look at the census of the Chippewas, what, 1899? about that year. And the reason is that a number of members of the tribe have benefits still relating to treaties. And so that's one of the reasons these people are continuing to, uh, there are other reasons which are cultural, but there are certain economic benefits remaining with your tribe and keeping contact. Um, we have somebody in the audience who's just uh, commenting about uh, a lot of times there are um, connections to the original tribal arrangements. And if you are with the, your tribal reservation, you can take advantage of some of those economic benefits. Yes. There's a question from the audience. I'm going to unmute her so that she can ask um, her question. Okay. Um. Hi. You share the, the um, picture of Chief Schopenhagen's that's at the DIA. Um, there's also another portrait of him at the Saginaw Art Museum that was, and they were both done by the artist um, Anger Irving Kaus, who was also originally from Saginaw. And um, in in the pic here, and you see the gorgets that. Um, Chief Schopenhagen's is wearing, 
those pieces are in the Saginaw History Museum, along with a pair of moccasins that his wife made for him. Um, a fascinating story about the intersection of three people from Saginaw, Chief Schopenhagen, um, Kaus the artist, and Charles Willis Ward, who um, commissioned the painting and then donated it to um, the DIA. Well, thank you. That's great to know. So if, for those of you who might not have picked up on that, this uh, painting that I'm including here is in the DIA and it was painted by, that's at the bottom of the slide, but I don't know if you can see it. Um, his name is Kaus. I, Kaus, yeah. Yeah, Kaus. And he was also a member of the tribe, you said? No, no. He, he was an American painter. He, he specialized, he, he was born in Saginaw, lived there, left as soon as he could. Um, he became a, a Western painter, was settled in New Mexico, for most of the year and mostly painted Taos Pueblo. Okay. Yeah. So um, there are, in this painting, um, Shapanagan has the gorgets. Those are the, the, um, the kind of like epaulets on his shoulders. No, 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 no. The, the necklaces. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The, the necklace. Oh, uh, the Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, yeah. And two okay. silver, and they were, um, he got them from either his father or his grandfather who had been given them um, by, I think, the British for his role, so I assume in the War of 1812. Okay, well, um, so thank you for correcting me on that. Okay. So the some of these things are in the Saginaw historical... The, so the gorgets that he's wearing, um, plus a pair of moccasins. Okay. And the moccasins were made by his wife? Yes. Okay. And let me back up to the image of Okamos for a minute. Oh, just missed it. Um, in this engraving of Okamos, he has, uh, is this the one? No, there, there are some that he officially um, sat for portraits, Okamis did, and he had, um, he was a, like given the rank of, I think, lieutenant by the British. And so he had some um, uh, military insignia that went with that rank that he often would wear, especially for official portraits. Um, Darla is here, and she said, from the Southfield Museum, she said there are 12 federally recognized bands of Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi in Michigan. There are 12 recognized bands of Odawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe in Michigan. And that's um, from Darla from the Southfield Historical Society. Thanks, Darla. And then there's a question. Can you comment a bit on Chief Pontiac's place of history? Also, there's a Williams Lake in Waterford. I assume it's named for him. Williams Lake does seem to be named uh, for Oliver Williams and the um, Pontiac Historical Society Museum, which is also called the Oakland History Center, has um, a lot of stuff on Oliver Williams. Uh, there was an archaeological attempt, a kind of study to try to identify where his original log cabin would have been because they knew what his parcel was and they knew he was on Silver Lake. Um, so he wasn't on Lake Williams, but it is, I understand, named for the Williams family. Um, and what was the other part of that question? Can you comment a bit on Chief Pontiac? Oh, place Chief Pontiac. Um, Pontiac was, uh, by some accounts, uh, Ojibwa and by others, Odawa and by others, sort of a mixture of the two. Like a lot of um, people at the time in the Great Lakes, he and his people ranged far and wide all through the Great Lakes, including Michigan, including Detroit, including Pontiac. Um, he featured largely in the um, uh, the war 
um, against the British in 1763. Can't think of the name of that war. The Indian War, it was the Seven Years War in yeah. Europe. It was a part of it. Yes, part of the Seven Years War of Europe, the French and Indian War. That's it. Um, and he represented a number of Native people who rose up against the incursion of colonials who wanted to take their land. But most of that activity took place, I mean, the fighting and stuff tended to be more south. Um, like in Ohio or in southern Michigan, there were some battles and skirmishes. And the Battle of, what's it called, in Ohio, there's a marker there, and I drive by it all the time off I-75. Can't think of what it's called right now. But um, so he, what I guess my point is, is he was really important as a leader, and he was really technically and strategically very uh, powerful uh, military strategist. And he was about um, 50 years before the War of 1812. So his legacy was part of why the Pontiac Company chose the name Pontiac. But he no longer had any direct you know, uh, impact on events going on at that time. Um, there are lots and lots of stories about Pontiac being from Pontiac, in Pontiac, um, lots and lots of stories. And it's not clear whether those stories just are nice to have. He probably did range through because he would have had to use a Saginaw Trail if he was using a land route. Um, but he is more associated with other areas and <clears throat> There was, um, there is a tradition that he stopped on Apple Island, which is in the middle of um, well, Orchard, Lake. Orchard Lake. That's right, Orchard Apple. Yeah, um, a Wild Lake comes to mind though because uh, the wall on one end was, um, I understand, actually created by native people. But anyway, uh, back to Orchard Lake and Apple Island. So there's a tradition that he came from or visited Apple Island or had a camp there very possible. Um, so I, when I when, it, when it, to think about his role, I think, um, I don't know how that plays to Native people. Maybe somebody in the audience can comment to that. Um, but I think from a historical perspective, that war had concluded and all of the economic stuff that was going on that, that um, relates to settlement of Michigan was kind of a later phase of, of American history. I don't know if that answered your question very well. Does anyone know how Pontiac is perceived by the indigenous people in, in Michigan? Anyone? I'm sorry? Does anyone know how Pontiac? Um, he, Pontiac was an Odawa and possibly Odawa and, and uh, Ojibwa um, leader in the 1700s, late 1760s. Um, so we, somebody was wanting to know about that. Was he the chief that died after he crossed into Canada? He was wounded. Um, are you thinking of Tecumseh? Okay. Well, I I don't remember the the story about how Pontiac died, but I thought it was after the war, and I thought he was attacked by someone on a street. I really didn't think it was in battle. Um, I I think Tecumseh died in Canada. Um, Pontiac died in St. Louis. St. Louis, rather across the Mississippi River in Illinois from St. Louis, and he is reputed to have been buried in a spot in St. Louis that is now underneath the baseball stadium. Okay. Any other comments, questions, information? Yes. I have a friend who said her grandmother said they were perceived, meaning that Indians were perceived somewhat negatively and they didn't want everyone to know that they were Native, but I mean, yeah. um, somebody in the audience was just telling a story about how a family member, uh, member 
uh, had uh, Native American heritage and um, that, that there was a negative perception. And so they actually hid the fact that they were Native American. Unfortunately, true for a lot of people. Okay, um, I think we're winding down here. Boy, I really appreciate everybody participating and um, helping me out when I um, made a mistake there. But I think uh, like a lot of people, I have a lot of questions. I still have a lot of questions that uh, maybe I'll get answers to. Um, I know that we wanna do more at the Birmingham Museum to help tell the story of local indigenous people. And so this is one attempt for us to do that. We do have some very cool artifacts, I have to say. We have some um, projectile points and bifaces that were found off the Saginaw Trail area at, on a farm near Birmingham. Um, and we have them in our collection and they show use of the trail by native peoples all the way back to 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. It appears as though the trail was heavily used um, on a seasonal basis uh, by different cultures over all that time who traded with each other. And so a lot of the materials they traded or manufactured and carried here were dropped or left behind. And they're di from distinctive different cultures and time periods. And we have uh, kind of some samples of those. If you ever want to come by, they're in the lobby at the museum and you can take a look at them. Well, I want to thank everybody and keep asking questions and please let us know if you find out some interesting information that we should have in our collection or know more about. Thanks to the Southfield Historical Society and Darla Van Hoy for her information, but also for working so hard on getting her exhibit. And they won an award this year uh, for their exhibit from the Historical Society of Michigan. So congratulations again, Darla. And goodbye, everybody.